Shall I start by telling you guys all a story? Yeah. This is a recent story. This happened to me last week. So it's actually on Joe's birthday. She was, uh, she was 44 last Wednesday. No. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, 21. And uh, I was starting the day by going for a run. And uh, as I was running along, I ran past some, you know, ducks and geese and things. And this one goose got quite angry with me. Obviously, it had, must have had its young around. So it started chasing me. <laughs> Has that ever happened? I know in Brighton, you get chased by seagulls or attacked by them. And uh, it bears in Canada? Absolutely. Bears, bears in Canada. <laughs> bears. You know, I've been to Canada twice. Both times I've been for a run and I've been secretly afraid that a bear is going to hunt me down. Because me and Rich went for a walk and there were these footprints around and he was like, they're probably bear tracks. I was terrified. They weren't bear tracks, were they? No, they weren't. No. It was a kitten. There you go. <laughs> so anyway, I was being hunted down, chased literally by this, this goose. And I was having to sprint and get quicker and quicker. And it can fly, which I feel is, is cheating. So it was catching up with me. And as, as I'm running this... Uh, a very Dutch scene, this mum is cycling past, she's got a kid on the back of her bike, another kid cycling their own bike, and they, they, started, uh, they started shouting, Snell, Snell, Sneller, Sneller, like, quick, quick, faster, faster. And I was like, oh, that's nice, they're cheering me on. And then I noticed that they were laughing, and I realised they weren't cheering me on. They were cheering on the goose, right, <laughs> to hunt me down, um, which is a silly story. But uh, as I was running, I was thinking about the message I was going to speak today, and it reminds me, I think often, <laughs> it didn't get me. Sorry, end of the story, I'm still here, <laughs> all right, still here. But sometimes the mission that God's called us to in the cities he's placed us in, it can feel a little bit like not we're being chased by a goose, but that we have, you know, the Bible talks about the enemy being a, a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. And it can feel like that. Have you, do you know what I'm talking about? There are times when the, either the pressure of ministry, what God's called us to, the challenge ahead of us, or just the, the hostile, secular nature of our cities can, can feel like that. It can just feel like you're being chased, being laughed at, being mocked. And that's an, an uncomfortable feeling, you know? I don't know if any of you can relate to that. And I was thinking about that and thinking for us gathering here today what's our in that context of the city that God's called us to the mission he's in which is sometimes uncomfortable difficult challenging uh, oppressive what's the biggest challenge for us what's the greatest challenge ahead for us in in planting churches in strengthening churches we're going to talk a, a little bit more about that through the, the week as we go. The plan for these few days is to talk a bit about who we are, some values that, that shape us uh, as a movement, as a family together. But what do we need more than anything? What's the biggest challenge? And it reminded me of this verse in Proverbs 4, which is going to appear on the screen as if by magic in a moment or two. It says this, keep your heart, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life keep your heart that's the that's the biggest challenge for us you know we're going to talk about some values as a family of churches that define us but they only really mean anything if they they strengthen us in our our love and passion and our our following of jesus of our keeping our hearts in him it's the biggest challenge we're going to face. And why is it the biggest challenge? Let me give you two reasons. I'm going to quote a few times this afternoon from John Flavel, who wrote a book called Keeping the Heart about 400 years ago. And he said that the, the greatest difficulty before we're converted, before we become followers of Jesus, the greatest difficulty is winning our hearts to Christ. It's a miracle. You need the, the grace of God to be birthed in you by the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest difficulty before conversion. The greatest difficulty, he said, after conversion is keeping our hearts with Christ. And again, it's, we need a miracle. We need the power of God at work. 
So the biggest challenge ahead of us, keeping our hearts, is that's always going to be the challenge before us. But particularly when we are on that front line of what God's called us to in, in planting churches. I'm going to tell some of our story as we go this afternoon for me and Joe, what God's used us and the church he's built in Amsterdam for the other cities, places we're in, the places we're going to go to next. On the front line of hostile, secular cities, in many cities where the church historically has been in decline and the devil has had his own way for decade after decade, there is, there's challenge, there's difficulty, but the main challenge is to, to keep our hearts. And what we believe as a family of churches, and I'm going to try and pick out a few things from this passage I'm going to read in a moment. As I said, they're only going to serve and strengthen us if they achieve this goal. Because, as the second half of this verse says, we keep our hearts because from it flow the springs of life. That's what we want, right? That's what I want. You know, in my own life, my own marriage and family, my own church. But for us as churches, as believers in, in our cities, we want blessing to come from the church to flow like just rivers of, of the glory of God into our cities to bring life. You know, that's, what, that's when we, we talk about church planning. We're not talking about establishing organizations. We're setting up just houses of the presence of God for his blessing to flow and to bring, to bring life. So to follow that passage, we need to start with keeping our hearts with all vigilance. So what I'm going to do to help us is I'm going to read a story. It's a bit of a long passage, but it's, an, it's a story of lots of drama, so it'll keep your attention. A story of a church that's perhaps a little bit like our church, is that's on the front line, that's in hostile territories, under pressure. And we're going to see how some of these four values that we're going to talk about as we go through this week, that are key to us as a family of churches, how they help to strengthen this church to keep their hearts. So let me read from Acts 12. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 24. It says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he seized him, he put him in prison delivering over, him over to four squads of guards, soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Peter was about, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up, quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself, put on your sandals. And he did so. He said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real. Before he was seeing a vision. When they passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city, opened for them of its own accord. They went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice. In her joy, she didn't open the gate, but ran in, reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, and he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. 
And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an, an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. Possibly my favorite, favorite verse in the Bible. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you. <laughs> just, what a phenomenal story. Just, just even reading it just then just blows me away. <sighs> and we're just so grateful that it's the same same God today. Just in, in our time, in our cities, in our lives. It's remarkable what you do uh, through your power is to deliver, to rescue, to set free. And we just want to pray that as we look at this passage this afternoon, that you guide us, speak to us, that you just be just gently, quietly even, just at work in our souls, just drawing us to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we've got, we've got four kind of main points where we're going to talk about some of these values that we're going to talk about as the rest of the conference goes on and then a number of sub-points that I hope will help us. So first of all, with aid, strength to keep our hearts on Jesus' mission. And point number one is reassess your calling. Whose mission is it? Whose mission is it? Let me find my passage again. Here we go. So we read as we find this story of this church in Jerusalem, the, there's dark days for them. You know, this is the same church that we just read about that this is the church, this is the Pentecost church. This is the Jerusalem church where God pours his power down upon and up. This is maybe a few months, perhaps a few years maximum later. And you can imagine all that hope that they would have felt. You know, they saw tongues of fire fall on them. They, they saw the Holy Spirit come upon the people of God. This church birthed, this new age of the Spirit dawned. 3,000 people saved. They just saw the beginnings of this remarkable community together. There was ever so much hope, so many dreams of what God was going to do. Perhaps a sense of calling and purpose, plans for their own lives. But chapter 12 is really a low point for them. You know, can you imagine the, the pressure that they must have felt under seeing one of their leaders killed by the king of their nation? Like, I can't, I know that happens even, even in some countries in our world today, but I can't imagine that happening in, in our cities. But the, the pressure that you must feel personally, you know, perhaps they were thinking, oh, but there were, there were things that God had called me to, you know? I, I, had, a, I had a plan. I, I had an idea. I, I, had a, I had a dream. I had all these hopes. It's only this pressure, this oppression, this trial has come. But yet, when you think about how, how we talk about our calling sometimes, maybe that's a new idea to you. But, you know, and we do believe that God calls us to things. He has things for us to do. But when you read about how Jesus talks about calling, as opposed to how we see it, I think it's a little bit different. There's a story in in the, the Gospel of Mark, where James and John are, are, are saying to Jesus, let us sit at, what, at your right hand. You know, they, they want this position of, of glory. That's how they want to serve. And Jesus says to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with 
the baptism with which I am baptized. And there's this sense that we can often think of our calling as like self-actualization of fulfilling our dreams and desires, you know? And Jesus says, drink my cup. It's like a completely different concept. Because Jesus is saying, I'm going to live a, a life of service. That's what he goes on to say. I'm, I'm going to give my life for my people. That, that's the cup that Jesus drank. You see, in, in Acts 5, when Peter and John are persecuted, they're beaten and whipped. It, it says they rejoiced because they were worthy of dishonor. Because that's how they understood their calling. It's like, well, we want to be like Jesus. So that means we're going to drink the same cup that Jesus drank. That's how they understood their calling. Just completely, completely different. And perhaps that's the, the question you want to ask yourself today to reassess your calling. Who's, whose mission is it? Is it your mission? Is it that you've, in a sense, you've taken your own dreams and plans and purposes and you've just tried to sanctify it, tried to spread a layer of Jesus upon top of it? But it's actually, it's what you want to do. It's your dreams. It's your hopes. Because the, the danger is if, if your calling just becomes about dream fulfillment, when, when trouble comes, when suffering comes, you won't be able to keep your heart. You won't. You just, you won't be able to cope because it's not, if it's all built upon you, you're just not designed to carry that burden. You know, whereas if your calling, your hope, your plans, your purposes are built upon, well, I'm living out the life of Christ. It's just a completely different foundation. And there's, as I said, there's nothing wrong with having a sense of calling, having a sense of, yes, this is what I want to do with my life. Just if you have that, just a clear sense of vision and purpose for your life, that's brilliant. But ultimately, the story of the book of Acts is these men and women who they live out the life of Christ. That's what the book of Acts is. You see it modeled in Peter's life, in Paul's life. They walk through the same experiences. They, they, both, they both put on trial. They both have uh, suffering. They're both persecuted. They're both whipped and they're, bo they're both beaten. All the characters from the book, the, the, the picture that Luke who wrote the book is trying to paint for us is to be a follower of Jesus, to, to live out the, the, the acts of Jesus is to live out the life of Christ. That's what our calling is essentially all about. Even here in this, in this story, it says that, that they laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. That's the same word that is used when Jesus is arrested. They laid violent hands on him. It's like Luke's trying to say to us, what's happening to the church here is what happened to, to Jesus. And he wants us to see our calling through, through that lens. Because when, when you begin to think about your calling in that way, it, do, it does protect your heart. Because if it is all about dreams and hopes and when they're, when they're crushed, it's, you can't, as I said, you, you won't be able to cope with that. I remember when, <laughs> we've got so many great stories to tell of our church, but it had a rocky beginning, let me put it like that. And uh, there was, I remember cycling through the city and, uh, and trying, to, trying to get my head around. We were, there's only about 12 of us. It's been 18 months. And we were, no offense guys, but we were a pretty dysfunctional bunch at the time. <laughs> uh, some challenges going on. We'd had one couple that had a massive crisis in their marriage. They'd had to leave us. Another guy, literally his appendix exploded and he was in a, a medically induced coma in hospital and he was, he was taken out. And uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm cycling just trying to process all of this and thinking this, this isn't what I planned. <laughs> this isn't what I dreamed or imagined. And I had to, I had to come before Jesus and think, if, if this is all it is, like if this, if this is what success looks like, you know, if this is as good as it gets, 
Is that enough? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Because in one sense, it isn't enough. Because I know what God had called us to. And I know what, you know, a city like Amsterdam needs much more than 12 dysfunctional people. It, it does. So in, in that sense, that it wasn't enough. But I had to know that Jesus was enough. You know, it's really important to grasp. And when we, we place, we reassess our calling and say, well, it's his mission. So if this is all it is, if this is as good as it gets, well, that's got to be okay, right? Okay, point number two. I have no idea why I start, what time I started, so I'm just going to keep talking. Yeah. Sorry, no. But we're only on point two of, we'll see how many there are. Okay, no. Point two, reconcile yourself to this reality that mission, what God's called us to, is impossible. Again, if you try and imagine this scenario that this church is facing, James has been killed by the sword, Peter's in prison. It says that Herod was planning to bring him out. That means Herod was planning to kill Peter. That's what his plan was. And if you think about what this church who, who are locked away praying, what would, they would have been thinking, they would have, perhaps they would have remembered Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew 16. You know, uh, Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Or perhaps they remembered Jesus' words to him at the, in John 20. You know, that you're going to go a place that you don't want to go. Um, you know, Jesus is saying, you're going to die. You're going to be a martyr. That's your fate. But he also said to him it was going to happen when he, when he was old. Jesus particularly makes that point. And I can imagine the church in Jerusalem, perhaps they were remembering those things and thinking, but Peter isn't old yet. Why is this happening? You know, perhaps they've been thinking, is this, is this the end game for our church? Is, is this as good as it gets? Is this, is this the end now? Is, is the clock ticking on our, on our endeavor? And what Luke he writes this story, the picture he's trying to paint for us is one of the Exodus story of a people who are suffering violence and fear and oppression. Pressure, you know, that Herod is, is, is like Pharaoh, this satanic evil figure, this just grotesque, violent warfare. Luke's saying this is like the Exodus story. And if I know a few of our churches have preached through the Exodus story, we did it a number of years ago. And when you go through the Exodus story, particularly as you're preaching through it week by week, you begin to realize that sometimes when we read Bible stories, we like to imagine ourselves and put ourselves in the place of the heroes in the story, you know, Peter or Moses. But as you go through the Exodus story, you realize we ain't Moses in this story. We're the people of God. We're just helpless. You know, that's, that's, that's the church here. They're just, they're just locked away, helpless. There's, there's Peter in this story, just helpless. And the, what God's called them to is pretty impossible at this point in the story. And that's, that's just so true of the things that God's called us to. Often I'll say to people that, the two hardest things I've done in my life are to move my family to a new country and to plant a church. I'm sure Joe would agree. Actually, you'd probably say the hardest thing is being married to me, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, planting a church is both the hardest thing I've ever done and the hardest thing I've never done. Just so often you look around and think, I didn't do this. I I played no part in this. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not just trying to self-deprecate or anything like that. But this, that's my, my most common experience is in church planning is, I didn't do this. How did this happen? You know? I heard a story last week of... Uh, it down, down, one of our leaders was telling me of a, a guy on our Alpha course who's an atheist... Is we've had this rare experience where our alpha courses got bigger as the weeks go on. It doesn't normally, alpha courses don't normally do that, but he's growing and this guy's an atheist, has joined it. And he said, oh, it's weird, I've, I've started to pray 
and all these coincidences have started happening. Wow. Uh, I don't know this guy. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm playing no role in the running of this alpha course. I, I'm just looking on and thinking, I didn't, I didn't do this. And I think the whole team are looking on thinking, we didn't do this. Like, God's just at work. That's what church planning is. That, that's the reality that we need to face up to. Because, again, if you don't, if you try and think that actually mission is possible in your strength, again, your hearts won't handle the pressure. You'll feel a sense of responsibility, a, a, a burden that's just too weighty for you to carry. Because this is the church of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest thing happening on planet Earth today. You, you're not, you don't have enough to carry that. So we need to reconcile ourselves to this reality. Mission is impossible. But thirdly, we have to remember that the mission of Jesus is unstoppable. I just I love the detail in this story where it says, Peter, Peter's asleep. First of all, if I'm in jail and I'm facing possible execution, there's no way I'm going to sleep. Like, how does he do that? I don't know. But it says that uh, the angel comes and strikes him and wakes him up but Peter's not really sure what's going on he doesn't think it's real he's in a vision and this is all happening in verse 7 8 9 10 it's only in verse 11 where it says when Peter came to himself it's like finally Peter wakes up but by this point he's delivered he's escaped the rescues happened you know have you ever had that experience where I remember once Joe and I were staying in a hotel and the fire alarm went off and Joe's Joe's great in the middle of the night you know, we, we learned it with some small kids. Joe's like, awake. And uh, Joe's like, Matt, the fire alarm's going off. We need to go. And I've got, I mean, it was just completely out of it. And I'd, I remember suddenly being outside the hotel in my underwear thinking, I don't know how I got here. You know, <laughs> Joe just led me out. And this is what happens to Peter. Like, he's got no idea what's going on. The guy's just in a dream. He's just sleepwalking. All right. I don't know if any of you know what it's like to sleepwalk, but uh, you can do all sorts of things that you've got no idea what happens until you wake up the next, the next day. But, you know, so often, perhaps even all the time, the church of Jesus Christ sleepwalks to victory. Why? Well, that's what happens. Is it Jesus is at work, and we're just being led along by the hand. When, when he's at work, how, however hard it is, it, it's all under his sovereign hand. Yeah. Uh, he'll, he'll always lead us to good. Michiel, one of our elders, he's sadly he's not here this week. He was preaching this Sunday of that story later on Acts, where Jesus appears to Paul in a dream and says, do not be afraid. I have many in this city. When, when Paul's in Corinth, and again, facing violent persecution do not be afraid I've got many in this city and that's Jesus heart for the cities he's put us in okay let me move on and then we're into B strength to keep our hearts by the power of the spirit point four God's remarkable power works through unremarkable people so true spiritual power often looks unremarkable. What I love about this story is when Peter's released, he goes to the house of Mary, <laughs> and then he just, they don't respond very well, right? He knocks at the door, Rhoda doesn't, she kind of looks and then runs away. They don't believe her. Peter's just there knocking and they're arguing amongst themselves. It must be his angel. And, and this doesn't look like a mighty church who've prevailed in prayer. Right? It says that they pray. They've been praying. God's answered them. And they're not like, yes, God's answered our prayer. They just don't believe it. It's pretty daft. All right? And that should encourage us because God uses daft, confused, unremarkable people. I remember once years ago, long before we moved to Amsterdam, for a while, Joe and I thought we were supposed to move to Morocco to plant churches, which would have been a bad idea. And we went and spent a day with people that were doing exactly that thing, met a bunch of people who were involved 
in mission and telling people about Jesus in Morocco. We met this one guy who he'd been in one of the cities in Morocco for, I think it was 11 years, and he had a church of seven people. Um, I thought, wow, that's hard. <laughs> uh, there were seven people all being converted. So in, in many parts of the, the Arab world, that's a massive success. You know, this guy was a hero. He really was. But it was, it was very ordinary. Actually, they all were. That was my abiding feeling when we were going home, was they were really ordinary people. There were no superheroes there. Like, no one's going to write books about these people. They're not going to get up on stages and speak at conferences. They're just completely unremarkable people. But those are the people that, that God uses. Because, again, we have to guard our hearts because so often we want to we want to impress. We want to be remarkable people. We want to do great feats. And, and, and often out of a, a heart of wanting to build the kingdom of God, but we want to do... We want to, all the fun stories and acts we want to live out. We want to do remarkable things that people are going to tell stories about. We want to have stories to tell that inspire people. But if you're not careful, that, that can begin to affect your heart. That you, you're not desiring Jesus anymore. You're, you're desiring remarkable things. And God often, he uses unremarkable people. <laughs> I remember a, a few years ago, it was when Neville was leading the church in Berlin and we had a meeting with a guy called Colin Barron, who's a leader in the, one of the New Frontiers churches. And he said to us, one of the things that's remarkable about your movement is how ordinary you are. <laughs> and he looked at me and Neville and said, yeah, in Berlin and Amsterdam, you're, you're both really ordinary. And that was it. <laughs> oh, thanks for that. <laughs> Still true, Neville. But God uses ordinary, unremarkable people, and he often uses us in unremarkable ways. You know, we, as Christians, we love, we love meetings like this. We love a bit of atmosphere sometimes. We love meetings where it's like, oh, can, the tangible sense of the presence of God with us. And there's nothing, that's, that's a wonderful thing that we should cherish and enjoy. But we want, so often we want prayer meetings like you have in Acts chapter 4, where they pray and the room shakes. Most prayer meetings I've been in aren't like that. Most prayer meetings I've been in are like this one in Acts chapter 12, where they pray and they're terrified, and then when God answers their prayer, they don't even believe it. <laughs> That's most prayer meetings I've been in, okay? And, but we have to be careful that we don't, we don't seek the atmosphere. We don't seek the remarkable things. We're experiencing it at the moment. At Liberty Church, we're, uh, we're hoping to adopt another church, which has been through a tricky couple of years in this city at the moment we're leading their services in the afternoon and still doing our services in the morning in the Vodelkirk and we have there are some times when if you've not been to our church in Amsterdam you really should because it's great but we have this amazing building this historic venue uh historic church building and suddenly when you have a room full of 200 people and everyone's singing you just hear the voices it's just like, wow like this is amazing I'm just so grateful we're here. And then we've had last two months of then going to this slightly quirky room with 20 people in a room that, that should hold 180 people and times of worship where you think, is anyone here? <laughs> is Jesus, is he here? And he's, he's just as much there it's not about the atmosphere is what I'm trying to say. And we can, we can please cherish and enjoy moments like this where we can worship and enjoy God together, but recognize he's at work. So often, I think it's something, if you've been involved in church planning, it's something you have to do even in your own heart that basically you've come from a big, vibrant church context and you suddenly find yourself on the ground in a city and there's just a few of you, you kind of have to even rebuild your own devotional life. Because it often gets caught up in the life of the church, wonderfully, prayer meetings, worship times, Sunday gatherings, and suddenly all that's stripped away. And you kind of remember how you have to remember what it, what it is to have your own walk with Christ again often. That can be quite challenging because it doesn't feel exciting. And often you've suddenly landed yourself in a context which can feel quite oppressive and quite challenging because the cities we're in often do feel like that. And it's in those moments you have to remember, okay, 
God uses unremarkable people like me. And often the way he works is, it, unremarkable is perhaps the wrong word. He does work in remarkable ways, but it might not look impressive to the outside. Okay, number five, make prayer your default response to pressure. You see, Herod in this story, he gets to use the sword to kill James. He gets to use the power of the state to throw Peter in prison. He goes on to say he uses the power of the economy effectively to feed the people around him who were suffering famine. So he's got a lot of powerful tools at his hand. And the church's only weapon is earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So Herod has the sword, the state, the economy, the, the, the office, the ability as king to do as he wills, and the church prays. And who wins? Yeah. Who wins? It's an easy answer. See, we have this mighty weapon when it comes to prayer. It's just so vital. I remember even just a few weeks ago, uh, Dan and I were in, Dan's one of our, our leaders in Amsterdam, we were at a meeting with a guy who'd been involved in overseeing a movement that planted 900 churches. So we were like, okay, tell us everything you know, we want to learn. And he said one thing that really struck out, he said to plant a church, you need two teams, one that goes and one that stays and prays. I thought, oh, wow, that's so true. Um, I mean, you want the team that goes to pray as well, don't get me wrong, right? But I thought it, his point was churches must have prayer. They just, they just, that's how churches are planted. That's how churches are strengthened and grow, is that they pray. That's how they win this mighty victory in this story, is Herod has all these weapons at his disposable, but they fail when it comes, they fall down and are broken when it comes against the power of prayer. So make prayer your default response to pressure. I'm going to rattle on, and then we're going to see the strength to keep our hearts as Jesus' people, as his church jesus is king of his church one almighty is more than many mighties you see there are three kings in this story there's herod the king there's peter who in a sense is as luke's trying to paint this picture of this exodus like people peter is in a sense their moses king hero that luke's trying to paint for us and there's Jesus, the three kings in this story. And what Luke does as he goes this through, is this going to come up on the, the screen behind me? That there is, here we go, with Herod. He says it goes through, it says in, in verse 20, Herod provides food and famine relief. He dresses in royal robes. He speaks with the voice of God. He's struck by an angel. He receives worship, and then wonderfully, he's eaten by worms. Let's move on to the next one. We see Peter, again, at the end of chapter 11, the people of God provide famine relief. It says in verse 8 that Peter dresses in sandals and a cloak. Verse 14, his, his voice is confused for that of an angel. Verse 7, he's struck by an angel. He rejects worship. He's not eaten by worms, he's delivered. And then move on to the last one, Jesus. Jesus... He's the bread of life. In Jesus' story, his garments were divided. Jesus is the word, the voice of God. Jesus was struck for us. We'll all be that bow the knee before him and worship. He was delivered over to deliver us. You're three kings in that story. It's so, I just find that so remarkable that not only three kings over this story, but Jesus is king of his church. That's what he's doing right now. He's leading, he's guiding, he's ruling over his people. And John Flavel, who I mentioned at the beginning, tells the story of a Greek hero from Greek mythology, Antigenesis, I think his name was, who facing battle, facing attack, and all his men were fearing and quaking, said to his men, how many do you count me for? How many do you reckon me for? How many of these troops am I going to defeat? And John Flavel says about that, he says, discouraged souls 
How many do you reckon the Lord for? Is he not an overmatch for all his enemies? Is not one almighty more than many mighties? Oh, well, we just moved to Amsterdam and I was trying to get to know as many different leaders and church partners and Christians in the city. And I met this one guy who he'd been paid for a year by a church partnering organization to do a report in church partnering on Amsterdam and what it would take to plant a church. So he'd been paid for a whole year to write this report. He'd surveyed 11 churches that all been planted in the last decade. His conclusion was church planting doesn't work in Amsterdam. We just moved there to plant a church. And he told me this. And I remember cycling home thinking, well, not knowing what to think. And I just had to pray, I believe in the resurrection. Like, you know, <laughs> church planting, yeah, if you assess the facts, it doesn't really work. But the resurrection works, right? Jesus works. One almighty is more than many mighties. It's not my church. He's king of his church. Then finally, D, we have strength in Jesus' gospel to keep our hearts. See, that's the wonderful thing that you've probably already picked up from this story. Only... Only Jesus can rescue Peter. He's just helpless, asleep, and Jesus delivers him. He's freed. It's this picture of Peter as this kind of new Israel rescued on his own Exodus story, set free. You know, only Jesus can keep our hearts. Let me just finish. I'm going to read this quote from that book by John Favell, and then we're going to pray. He talk, he's talking about what it takes to keep our hearts. And he says, we are as able to stop the sun in its course or make the rivers run backwards as by our own skill and power to rule and order our hearts. We may as well be our own saviors. And yet Solomon speaks properly enough when he says, keep your heart because the duty is ours but the power is of God. Let me pray for us. Why don't you just stand to your feet? Jesus, we thank you for those words at the end of the book of Jude, where Jude encourages us to keep yourself in the love of God. But then the, the book finishes by saying, by praying a prayer, now to him who is able to keep you. And... Um, we want to commit our hearts as a people together on your mission. To, we want to keep our hearts with all vigilance. We know we have a, an enemy prowling, seeking to devour and destroy. We want to keep our hearts, but we know we're, we're as able to run the rivers backwards. We can't do it. The only way we can keep our hearts, the only way we can go about your mission the only way we can, we can follow you is we need you. The, the, the duty is ours, but the power is of God. And we just want to invite you, Holy Spirit, just to just come and fill us with your power to, to fulfill that greatest of challenges ahead of us, to keep our hearts, Lord, in, in the midst of trial and suffering, confusion, uh, doubt, difficulty, frustration, delay, disappointment. We want to keep our hearts. And we can only do that by your strength. So we just ask, invite your Holy Spirit, would you come fill us right now? Just before we sing or do anything else, just, why don't you just pray? You have to do it out loud, just quiet in your heart. I just invite the Holy Spirit to come and help you. Just invite him back into your heart and ask him to help you to keep it.